dear colleagues and friends, um, when I was preparing for the conference here, I asked Federico Serragnoli uh, about what I had two or three topics that, that I could speak of, and then he encouraged me to talk about this, the psychedelic renaissance and thereafter. And I have to say, this will not be a presentation about my experiences as a therapist. It won't be scientific in the sense that it is based on research. Is it, it is more about my personal thoughts and opinions and, of course, also my concerns, anxieties and um, worries I have sometimes about what's happening. And Federico quoted yesterday um, Aldous Huxley, who said, two-thirds of, two of our concerns are just useless. One third is worse to have it. I don't know, maybe it is the concerns of the two-thirds that I should not express. It's not interesting for the universe, but maybe that one or other concern will touch you as well. I hope for that. Um, how does it work? Yeah. Just the disclosure statement for the beginning. You see I have three counseling agreements with companies. And when I'm asked why I'm doing that, I can say I do it for two reasons. I have always given my expertise for the sake of good and safe practice. And this is true in the individual um, treatments I do when people ask me uh, about uh, safe practice. I give uh, advert, um, advert, um, I give information about harm reduction, safer use, and when I do it for the companies, it's the same. I'm paid on an hourly basis, and I can say that I have no shares of one of these companies. For SAPT, uh, which I'm president of there, I'm working for free since 25 years. I get the appreciation of my friends and colleagues, and that's the best salary you can get, as you maybe know. Um, yes, let me... A um, little bit go into fantasy and association, uh, personal fantasies. I'm playing a little bit with the, with the what, what means the Renaissance, and there are some analogies, but don't take it too serious. It's not meant to be scientific in the sense that it will be the same, the psychedelic Renaissance and the Renaissance in the, uh, in the late Middle Ages, in the 15th century, that arised in this northern Italian um, communities in the cities where the citizenship was come to, to wealth. They were non-aristocrats and they have a new uh, way of self-confidence, I thought, that was in some way the birth of the modern thinking of the modern human beings, like you see it in this um, wonderful statue of Michelangelo, the David. And for me, it, this... this um, this sculpture says, okay, this man is made by God, like you see it here, naked. And, but his nudity also shows his strength and his power and his self-confidence. And he will um, fight against the monster um, on his own. He can rely on himself. And that is the new era that started at that moment. And what happened afterward? And I want to follow three tracks what was embedded or followed the Renaissance, still we are in the, in, the, in the history. Thereafter, one track is humanism. And humanism is the human being that is able to perceive the, the world and to understand the world by its own capacities. He has um, his own way of like on this, on this um, painting from an unknown artist, it's only from the 19th century, and it's not Renaissance, but it shows the man going beyond, going beyond the limits and, show, and looking through the, the globe, the celestial globe, into the mechanics of the universe. And second thing is Reformation that emerged in the period of Renaissance, which in fact started as an anti-corruption movement, but it also wanted to open the way to God more directly, that man can, through the revelation of the Holy Bible, um, see um, and understand uh, 
and, and have the faith for God. And the, the reformators, they just put away all the unnecessary things, the pictures in the churches and the, the, sen, the saints and the mediation by the priests. And when it becomes a little bit too um, compulsive, then we, we speak about Puritanism. But in fact, they wanted to clear up a little bit. And the third track is um, what started in the, in, the, in the Renaissance period is the discovery of the world that Columbus um, went across the Atlantic Ocean and he found India, not really, but he found unknown countries. And together with discovery, something that uh, is called colonialism and exploitation started as well. And I don't know if you really see the look of... Um, Hernan Cortes, and to me, this look says, this look shows an unsatiable hunger, a greed, and um, in some ways, I think he wants to possess this beautiful princess here, the the sister of this um, of this chief, and behind this princess is the gold, of course, and is the all the resources of this indigenous people, and he will not ask for them; he will take it. Yeah, okay. The psychedelic renaissance. What is the psychedelic renaissance? I was reflecting a lot on that, and I mean, I experienced the, um, the emerging of the psychedelic renaissance, and uh, let me give a brief historical overview. Um, I would say it started in the early 90s. Franz Vollenweider told us yesterday when he started his research, this was 92. So this was a time where um, no one, basically not many people, especially not many researchers were interested in, in psychedelics. And it was not that good an idea to, to found and to ground your your career on psychedelics if you wanted to have an academic career. And so I think really that Franz was one of the courageous ones to do it. Nevertheless, he was a member of a small group, Hefter Foundation, and this was a kind of network uh, worldwide of all these, um, these uh, researchers together. And they also helped Franz finance his work because at that time there was not the money to do a lot of things. That was in, and then at the end of the 90s, it started also a psilocybin research in, in Baltimore at Johns Hopkins University. And they published uh, an important paper that I will show afterwards in 2006. And in the same time, Rick Doblin, who founded um, MAPS, was then starting at the, at the early 2000s with his MDMA uh, research for PTSD. In 2004, they started um, with that, and Peter Owen, uh, he visited together with his wife, Verena, they went to Rick Doblin, and he started doing MDMA research in Switzerland and got approval in the same year, 2004, started with that. But the important year, I think, the, when the, the Renaissance really started, I think, was 2006. In 2006, Albert Hoffmann um, was uh, uh, celebrated his 100th birthday, and there was a big conference in Basel with <coughs> 1,500 uh, people attending this conference from all over the world. And it was, um, I mean, that was so enthusiastic for all the people, and Albert Hoffmann was just a blessing over all that. And in the end of, the, of this conference, some people said, uh, I was not among them, but they said, this is a turning point now. There's so many people coming to Basel from all over the world, and they have the power and the will. They want to do something. And we have written then an open letter to, to uh, federal offices for public health all over the world, also for Switzerland. In this open letter, it was said, please uh, make LSD research happen again. And I think the only one to respond was uh, Pascal Kuschmann, the Ministry of Health in Switzerland of that time. And his response was uh, easy and clear. He said, when you meet the ethical and scientific requirements, then we will approve this um, research. And we had the impression, OK, when this is true, then we can start. Um, 
In 2006, also this paper appeared from Roland Griffiths and Bill Richards and uh, his uh, colleagues. And I think this psilocybin paper was in, in that sense important because it, show, it showed directly that psilocybin can have a, a value, it can have sense. This is not phase one um, research where you look about the properties of the, of, the, of the substances, what they are all about, but it was really a paper of it makes sense to take it. And I think this was quite important in, in what, what should happen after that. So he was also, Ron Griffiths, one of the brave ones. Um, uh, I think, like Franz, he had a, a brilliant career. He was a, a researcher of, I think, mainly addiction and tobacco. And then he decided to go into psychedelic research. That was not, I can imagine, not an easy decision for him as well. And uh, one of my personal heroes and favorites is Bill Richards. Bill Richards is a fantastic therapist, and I love him very much. I like to be the dwarf on his shoulders. And um, he, he started in the early 60s. He was one of the team um, with Walter Pank in the Springgrove Hospital in Baltimore. And he was, I, th I think he said he was the last one to, to finish there when, uh, in the 1970s, when everything was, uh, came to a, to a stop. He had, at the end, he said he had one secretary and himself to finish the studies and so, and then the Springgrove Hospital, uh, this department was closed. And he had to wait another more than 20 years when uh, uh, the research in 99 restarted in Baltimore. He was, he was there again and he did uh, the therapeutic uh, work in these in this studies that have been done for a long time. And of course he, is one of the important people for the psychedelic renaissance, Rick Doblin. He, he founded uh, his MAPS Foundation in 1986 as a direct reaction um, of the illegal illegalization of MDMA in 1985. And Rick Doblin really wanted to, that MDMA would become a prescribable substance again. And I think now it's one or two or three years maybe, and he will achieve this goal. Not to forget him, I mean, I mentioned Franz, he prepared the soil, um, psychedelic renaissance was rising off or from. Let me mention these two books. Um, ben Sessa published the, the book, The Psychedelic Renaissance in 2012, although I don't think that he was the inventor or the creator of this term. I, once I asked Rick Doblin, do you know who created the psychedelic renaissance as a, as a term? And he said, no, he does not know, but I think it was him talking in a presentation in 2009 or 2010. I, I in my um, memory, he, it was him in this, in this presentation that he talked about the renaissance. I mean, it's, it's not so far away as, as idea. And, uh -huh, and the other one, How to Change Your Mind, this uh, number one bestseller from Michael Pollan, um, came out in 2018, and it was worldwide, I think, a, a very considered book and a bestseller in the United States and maybe in other countries as well. And, of course, it showed that now psychedelics have arrived in the middle of the society. They are really a, a topic of interest for a lot of people now. This study is also an interesting one. It was published in 2017 by uh, Robin Carhart Harris and David Nutt. And it was a, fe a feasibility, like we say, a pilot study of uh, psilocybin in treatment resistant depressed patients. And although it was a, a very small study, I think it had, had a huge impact. It was, it was um, at the beginning of this of this boom, we can say, or this hype with psilocybin, which is now still going on. And uh, as you maybe know, psilocybin now has a breakthrough designation from the FDA in the United States, which, say, which says this is a very important uh, therapy and uh, this is more, it's an easier way to get through all the regulation process and all that. And this is based only on this 
small open label study. I mean, it's, it's even not a phase two study. It's, of course, not a phase three study. But upon this study, that, uh, is, is based a lot of movement that hell uh, came afterwards. Um, ah, yes, uh, you have a little text here. It's uh, openly feasibility. 12 patients, and they, um, um, they received two doses, I think, of psilocybin, 10 and 25 milligrams. And then what they found is uh, relative to baseline depressive symptoms were markedly reduced one week and three months after high-dose treatment. Marked and sustained improvements in anxiety and anhedonia were also noted. So that sounds quite promising, and on this promise is based a lot of what came afterwards. Yes, let's have a look, and thereafter, what happens now? Is it only a hype, psychedelic renaissance? You know this gadget, Fidget Spinner, it arrived in 2017 and the magazine, the US magazine Forbes um, labeled it the must-have office toys of the year. But after a few weeks, the Fidget Spinner uh, disappeared completely. I've never seen him again or seen it again. So there are, obviously there are hypes, they come, they burn like straw fire, hot and, and, and but not very long. I have found this, the hype, cycle, the hype cycle in technology. It is a, an American um, consulting company who published that in the, somewhere in the internet. So the a technology arises and then um, it, uh, there is a lot of attraction and attention to it. So um, after the trigger you have this high rise of invisibility and with a peak of inflated expectations. And then all of a sudden, something f different thing happens. I mean, the, get, the fidget spinner was not interesting enough, maybe, or other things, disadvantages of something. And then it's a kind of disillusionment, but followed by a next phase where it is clearing up a little bit what a thing is all about. And then uh, maybe a new plateau of productivity um, will happen with in more integrated in a the, uh, in a more integrated sense the things are this technology is usable let me make an example when i was a child or a young people coffee was made this way and uh, with these italian machines you can screw to get together this was the way drinking or preparing coffee then came uh, nestle and they started with nespresso um, with the help of george clooney it was maybe the, the best advertising campaign ever. And everyone had the impression the only way to drink coffee is Nespresso, of course. Maybe this is in this hype cycle we can uh, think that there are disadvantages, there's so much ma material with that, the coffee is very expensive and all that stuff, and it will maybe go down. I think it's still going on, the high with Nespresso, but maybe it will turn out a little bit like that, and then in the end, coffee drinking will not disappear in our world. <coughs> the same with the psychedelics. What happened to the psychedelics? And of course, there was a first hype in psychedelics, as you certainly know. Albert Hoffman discovered LSD in 1943, and this started a whole era of um, exploring and uh, research of, of the substances, of the substances that they can induce psycho psychosis-like states. Maybe they have a, a potential for treatment, and there are several thousand uh, publications coming f after 1943. But then in the 1960s, uh, this happened. Um, Timothy Leary, Ken Kesey with his bus doing the acid test, which in fact was not a test, it was a party. Uh, but he traveled around the United States with this, with this uh, old school bus, um, so beautifully decorated. But it stopped by <laughs> after in 1972 or 71, Richard Nixon declared the war on drugs and Timothy Leering being the most dangerous person in the United States. And so um, the hype stopped in the disillusionment. But it didn't stop um, completely. 
Um, there was uh, <laughs> underground use all over the years, and um, I think this was important for the Renaissance to rise. It never disappeared completely, and a lot of people shared the interest for these substances in non-legal circumstances. I started with friend groups or therapeutic groups, I don't know, and then parties in the late 80s and the 90s, and there was a huge a knowledge was already present about these substances arising from the underground. Yes, now, are we amidst of the second hype cycle in psychedelics, or how will it continue? That is a question should rise. I will, need, I will not answer it completely, in fact, because I don't know, like you. But let's have a look at some aspects. Will there be a psychedelic humanism? Like this person said, know thyself. So, you know, know thyself was uh, written at the Apollon Temple in Delphi, where the oracle was hosted. So, get to know yourself. And Albert Hoffman says, heaven and hell are in the human being. And it is so that with this substance, LSD, you now get an insight into your own hell or your own heaven. And another quote I like very much, that's the, way, that's the reason why I placed it here, from Aldous Huxley. And also I think what he says here is founded in some psychedelic experiences he might have had. I almost, I'm almost embarrassed, but after all the decades of searching, after the many spiritual and psychological paths I have come to know, after all the numerous great masters, and maybe his masters were also um, psychedelics, like LSD or mescaline, I have been privileged to meet, have come to the following conclusion. The most powerful and beneficial practice is to be kind to oneself and to the whole universe. But psychedelic humanism is also enjoying life on uh, psychedelic parties, like here in the Boom Festival in Portugal. So, experiencing ecstasy and uh, the joy of life is just a, a, a way of individual bliss. Will there be a psychedelic reformation, something like that? Matthew Johnson, um, at, at, uh, uh, working in Baltimore as a researcher, and I like him very much. He's a, a bright and lovable person, really. Um, he published this, this paper, Consciousness, Religion and Gurus, Pitfalls of Psychedelic Medicine. And he's writing about, about that, and his concern I can't, can understand. At, and he says in this paper it has unfortunately become fashionable and commonplace for statues of Buddha to be present in psychedelic session treatment rooms, in addition to other concerns about conflating religious beliefs with empirically based clinical practice, the introduction of such religious icons into clinical praxis unnecessarily alienates some people from psychedelic medicine. Sounds to me a little bit puritane. <laughs> and I think maybe it's not such a bad thing to have Mary and the saints or Buddha or whatever symbols in your room. Even if it, it will not spoil everything, so don't be more pope than the pope. <laughs> and um, another article from um, Roland Griffiths and his colleagues. Psychedelics and Psychiatry, Keeping the Renaissance from Going Off the Rails. And he says, It is critically important that the medical and scientific communities be vigilant in opposing the conflating of science with larger cultural agendas, as occurred in the 1960s with the blending of psychedelics into the anti-war and other anti-establishment movements. The enthusiasms that at attend such agendas should not be all allowed to supersede the scientific and regulatory process meant to carefully wet these substances. I mean, I understand what he wants to say, and I think you understand it as well. Um, of course, I'm, I don't agree with the world savers who want to, to cure the world in giving LSD to Donald Trump and um, 
uh, Jair Bolsonaro just for, for the healing of the world. Maybe this is an exaggerated belief and, and hope. But I think the, the danger now for not becoming a hype that will, um, that will burst is not only from the old hippies, but um, I wonder why, it, why he does not mention the other problematic uh, area, maybe. Um, Newsweek magazine published this article, Magic Mushrooms may be the biggest advance in treating depression since Prozac in September 20, what, 22. One day later, Christian Angermeyer uh, tweeted, I would delete maybe and replace with R, otherwise amazing article. That's the reason why Atai Life and Compass Pathway rock. Medical use of psychedelics has the potential to completely change the way we treat mental health issues. Christian Angermeyer is one of the main investors uh, in psychedelics. And of course, I think his enthusiasm and his wish to replace maybe with, uh, with R is good for business, of course. But it is, not, it is really not based on scientific uh, data. It is just a wish, a wish and a, a wish in that hype that is now has um, arrived at the stock markets and makes the, these companies the darlings of the, of the stock market, like you read here, Mind Medicine, the best performing stock is up to 800% and has attracted the likes of Kevin O'Leary as an investor. Or the other, many psychedelic stocks experienced triple digit returns. By some estimates, the psychedelic drugs market is projected to grow at a compound annual growth of what 16.3% to reach 6.85 billion by 2027. So this is this is a real hype, isn't it? Um, but also this, um, I think psychedelics become part of the tourism, entertainment, and wellness industry, like. A lot of people just going to the Amazonian uh, region and having their workshops and whatever for, for spiritual wellness. And this causes also problems. If you have nothing to do next weekend and you don't care about ecological footprint, you can go to Las Vegas <laughs> and uh, <laughs> join at the intersection of psychedelic business and wellness. It's the first meeting, it's announced as the first meeting of psychedelic wellness. Um, I'm slowly closing my presentation. Um, I found this um, paper to be very interesting. It was published in, in this year by the same authors, partly David, Robin Carhart Harris, David Nutt and David Erizzo, a trial of psilocybin versus escilatopram for depression. And the, in the conclusions, the author write, on the basis of the change in depressant scores on the KIDS six, S, SR 16 scale. At week six, this trial did not show a significant difference in antidepressant effects between psilocybin and escitalopram in a selected group of patients. Secondary outcomes generally favored psilocybin over escitalopram, but the analysis of these outcomes lacked correction for multiple comparisons. Larger and longer trials are required to compare psilocybin with established antidepressants. So that sounds quite humble to my ears, and I think that's good. And it's good that these authors published this paper because it's a, it's a kind of the development of what happened after 2017, causing this, this big interest for psilocybin and others. And now this paper that shows it's maybe not as simple as we think. And maybe it's not the cure for everybody and every, every, everything. And we have really to go into a, a deeper um, understanding and a deeper research and treatment understanding before we can say for what it is and for what not. 
To end up my presentation, I have two last slides, which are presenting my vision of it, what I would like that the future would bring. So hopefully it will become a reality. I think what we need is cooperation rather than competition. And this cooperation um, should be that we develop skillful psychotherapeutic approaches, that we generate robust scientific data, that we have sufficient training programs and well-trained therapists doing the, this therapy, that we have legalized substances. And legalization does not mean that everyone can buy it in the drugstore or in the warehouse, in the, in the micro. Um, legalization means that these substances have a legal status, and legal status means they are hand, you, we can handle it in some or other way. Maybe they remain prescribable drugs, like, like for instance, morphine is still a, a narcotic drug. Not everyone can get it, but you can, there is a, a way of prescribing it. That's what legalization is. And I think we have um, to have an integrated traditional use and cultural diversity. Um, what was presented yesterday and said that uses time to talk to each other. So we need also time. I think that's, that's an important thing. And yes, of course, we need also a cultural embedding in the Western, in our society and world, and the social acceptance on we are on the way on that. So, psychedelics for the future. In my hope is that we have time for understandable growth, development and differentiation for the safe and beneficial use of various kinds of purposes. And my, f my dear old friend, Vanya Palmers, I, I had a, a conversation with him maybe one year or so, ago about all these what I am talking now and then he said I'm confident that LSD has the potential to protect itself and us from exploitation and misuse. May he be right. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk, Peter. So now we have, once again, 15 minutes for questions. So raise your hands if you have any. I, I want to say I'm 60 years old now. My ears are not that good as young people. Please speak up and speak slow, so I will understand your questions. Thank okay. you. OK. <laughs> um, I'm curious whether this psychedelic renaissance that came after a long break was, is, was or is using any of the results that the early psychedelic research in the 50s was already uh, using or is there, did it start from, from zero? <laughs> no, it didn't start from zero, but I think that all the results are not entirely or not enough appreciated because it is not that the, the, the research in the 1950s or so was bad research and silly people doing it, not at all. I mean, they were as bright as we are today and they had a, a, not a lot of knowledge and insights. It is only the methodology changed and the, the control, randomized trial, placebo control didn't exist mainly at that time. Now it is the golden standard. We have to do it that way. In, in that period, you did open label studies, but the way they did it and the, the results they presented there, they are also valuable. And I think we should not forget that a lot of things have been done. It's not, it's not starting by zero. Yes. So I was just wondering, you were talking about, about legalized substances. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to know what your opinions were on places like Amsterdam where anybody can buy magic truffles in shops. What do you think about that? What I think personally about that, I think that our situation is a dead end here. Um, it, is, it makes no sense to, 
to that the police runs after all these people consuming psychedelic drugs or, or also cannabis. If the solution will be that every, everyone can get it, I'm not so sure if that is the right way. I think we should have a regulation in the, in the sense of not everyone can buy tobacco or alcohol. We have rules for that. You have to be 16 years old or 18 years old, and you can get it. And I mean, with psychedelic drugs, maybe it's even a little bit more complicated. We, ha we would have to, to reach or to identify those people who are really at high risk. And I think it's not a, a good idea to sell psychedelic drugs to people that are, that are at high risk uh, getting a psychosis. And how to sort out, like, if you have to have a psychedelic driving li license or something like that to, to get the substance, it, it's difficult to say. But I think we should have the energy to think about that and to, to go into that process in the, and to know for whom would it be not a problem to get these substances and why should they not get it? So this, this um, development, I think we should enter in. All right, thank you. But we know that people are still going to do psychedelics, whether it be legal or not. So do you think there would be a day where we could offer more um, like classes in school, maybe do more harm reduction, so people are more aware of the dangers of it? Yeah, of course. This is, of course, this this would be one of the points to 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 give good information and that, um, for especially for young people is a kind of edu <coughs> education in drugs. I mean, we should do it even now because the most dangerous drugs are alcohol and and and, and cigarettes, tobacco smoking. And there is not maybe not enough education for that. Although I mean, even sixteen-year-old people, they know that it's not. Um, very healthy to smoke cigarettes. Uh, it will not be everything, but education will be one, one of the measures. And it's better to invest the money into such education than in police uh, measures. Thank you very much. Um, hello. Um, could, you, could you explain why in uh, all the study you presented to us and the study we, we've seen before, uh, there is still um, not a lot of patients? What are the main reasons that uh, lead study to have uh, 10, 20 or 30 patients and not much more? Because this research is very time consuming. It's not like when you want to, to prove uh, anti-hypertensive drug. I mean, it's easy to make a study with 5,000 participants. But here, it took us now four years to treat 40 patients, because every treatment is one year, and we are a team of eight. And if you want to if you want have treatment studies with psilocybin or LSD or MDMA with 500 or 1,000, you need a, a, a great number of therapists doing it. You need amounts, uh, huge amounts of money. And that is the main reason. I mean, the money now is coming, but all the trained people still is lacking. You cannot do mm. studies with hundreds of people. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Yes. Um, I was wondering, there are various uh, reasons for causing depression in general. And there is depression caused by trauma. Yes. Is there a differentiation between treating people um, with antidepressants and with psychedelics in case of trauma. So how do you differentiate between that? Yeah, I mean, the concept in, in antidepressant anti treatment is just to lower symptoms, to make your symptoms more supportable. And that is okay. I'm not, I'm not a, a missionary in saying antidepressants are bad. I use them in my everyday practice. And the approach with psychedelics is, is completely different. There is making open it up and feel the symptom and go into the symptoms, feel your anxiety and feel your dis dissociative um, behavior. And by, by seeing that, like the, the humanist who looked into the sky, uh, it's by, by learning about what, what's happening here is the idea that that is the cure. And, uh, but the approach is different. And I think it is not that health um, treatment, um, mental health will, will completely change with psychedelics. It will, you have, will have an additional tool to treat some people 
who are ready for that process, who are able for that process, but you will still need antidepressants. This is not a contradiction, it's not the one or the other. We have both and then we have the choice. Yes, uh, hello? Yes, hello. <laughs> there. <laughs> I was wondering, you said uh, that we need strong data, uh, scientific data, yes. and to be aware of uh, traditional use of those substances. And I'm wondering, like, a lot of people report to have a, a huge mystical and spiritual ex experience uh, by t taking those substances. Mm -hmm. And um, I have the feeling that the scientists fear a little bit this aspect because we can't measure it. So my question is, in your opinion, how can we gather those two aspects? Hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm a therapist, and you are right. Even me, I'm fearing a little bit too much to go into spirituality, because I think I'm really, by my identity, a psychotherapist, and what I'm doing is psychotherapy, and I know how to do it. And I think if, pay, if people have um, spiritual experiences, this is a wonderful thing, and I love to talk about it, and I love to help them to understand it. But for me, it's not a requirement for the therapy. I mean, there are a lot of people not having spiritual experiences in the narrow sense, yet they are having a profit or a benefit of the treatment. And I am looking for ways. How is it possible to do psychedelic therapy also with everyone, not only with those who have spiritual experiences? In research, I think it's easier to measure what Friederike Holze presented, because this is clear def clearly defined. When you start about measuring spirituality, I mean, it's, it's really another field. It's difficult, and it's difficult then also to say, what is the, the, the impact these uh, this experiences have? I mean, Franz Vollenweider did it on the, in this study he was uh, talking about yesterday in the panel, um, but, but this is, uh, I think it's, just, it's more, it's not so strong in, in the expressing of, of this, this data is not so strong than other data we can produce. But um, I think yet it is done at some point and it will be done. <coughs> but we okay. should not confound therapy with spiritual experiences. Hello. Hello, yes. Here. One yes. question. Uh, so as of today, is it possible for a person to, that is not suffering from major depressive disorder or something to go to a therapist and have um, psych psychedelic assisted therapy? And then if it's not possible here in Switzerland, if you consider that this can be done in, in the foreseeable future? Um, I, I'm not sure that I, if I got your question. Yes, it is possible. This person can be, uh, get treatment in Switzerland with what Peter Owen presented yesterday, this kind of limited medical uh, use of psychedelics. By individual approval, we can uh, write a report to the uh, Federal Office of Public Health and ask them to treat that person. But Switzerland is unique for that. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, unique. you have seen, Peter and me, we have treated together how much? How many? 50 patients in, two, in, in seven years. So this is, I mean, this is a, a drop on the hot stone. That's clear. That's not a model for the future. You have to scale it up. But the, for me, the question is, in, what is the speed for doing that? Uh, hello? Uh, yes. 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 My question is quite similar to the former one about the, the so-called conflict between spirituality and scientists, but um, I want to talk about the conflict between the psychedelic therapy and the psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. Don't you think that um, it's, not, uh, it's not by chance that in a country like France, called yesterday the Saudi Arabia of psychedelics, <laughs> psychoanalysis does still have um, this uh, mummies uh, on on the um, on psychotherapy? Uh, don't you think that um, the renaissance of psychedelics is also also announces the decline of psychoanalysis? The decline of psychoanalysis that it will disappear. Uh, <laughs> decline. Decline. <laughs> I mean. 
when I, when I started my training, mainly, basically all the therapists w which I learned from were in some ways trained in psychoanalysis. And I think it's still a valuable, um, um, a valuable model of looking at the relationship between the therapist and the patient with transference and countertransference and also the conflict model is very useful. But it has no more the primacy uh, of um, defining what happens. I've m today, it's uh, how the way we explain what happens in, in uh, psychedelic therapy is more based on neurobiology and on um, um, cognitive behavioral models because they are more widely used and elaborated. And I think psychoanalysis explained a lot of things in the past and maybe it will a little bit yeah decline as it does and maybe f France is still a, a, a fortress of psychoanalysis maybe I don't know and it's I mean it's a I think the, the, the accepted drug in France is the wine and then maybe there is no place for other drugs <laughs> it's also one of my hypotheses and, but I think we should not forget about psychoanalysis, but it is not the main, the main theory to explain what happens here. And I mean, uh, psychoanalysis had not, has not a lot of explanation for spiritual experiences. This is... Yes? Uh, there, is, there is research uh, on psychedelic drugs through uh, Gold Standard and um, University. And I'm asking, isn't it possible to, to um, learn from all the experiences of the people who take psychedelic uh, substances illegally um, by producing um, a project of citizen science? Uh -huh. Maybe it exists already, I don't know, but it might be a very good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm really not the expert in citizen science, but I think the place for citizen science is more social sciences. And the regulation process for um, pharmaceutical compounds is so highly structured and so complicated. And I mean, it, it becomes every year even more complicated. Ten years ago, I could do this, this pilot study in my practice and I have done most of the protocol by myself and, and with the help of MAPS and so. And the 10 years in between with the new study, I, I wouldn't have been able to do it anymore now in 2017. So I needed really the help of Matthias Liechti and without him this, this study could not happen. We need the people who know what to do for doing medication research and there bringing people together is not... Yeah, I mean, this is important, and of course I know, and as I, as I said, the underground always knew that this is a good thing. They not, not only learned it by the psychedelic renaissance, of course this knowledge is, is here, but to bring it on the f surface and to bring it into all these regulation processes, you have to, to, you have to go a, a professional way. There is no other way. Otherwise, you should have to change the regulation processes. And that's just another, another story, I think. Hello. Yes. Over here. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation and also very comprehensive, Welcome. nice overview of the history and uh, very funny as well. So my question uh, regards, again, going back a bit to the spirituality mm -hmm. question. And uh, I have kind of this observation that uh, uh, it seems to me that indigenous, in indigenous practices with these substances and experiences, they always come together, both the medicine and the spiritual, religious part. And uh, I know it's a difficult question, but uh, just as also a matter of thought, uh, aren't we missing out something, uh, at least as observing how they are used on indigenous contexts, of... Uh, putting the spiritual part aside even, mm -hmm. I understand it's very, very difficult to somehow integrate it into the treatment practices. Yes. Yes, we have that lack of knowledge. We don't have the rituals. We don't have, we don't have a, a clear framework of how to, 
to come together for spiritual experiences. And I mean what Vanya and Franz have done uh, to, to bring psilocybin into the, the framework of meditation is just an attempt for doing it. How could we combine, for instance, Zen meditation and psilocybin experiences in a meaningful way so that one helps the other? But I mean, this is a small beginning and um, our traditions are completely dif different. We don't go to the Catholic or Protestant church for having, in that sense, spiritual experiences. I mean, we can, but it's more about religion, about doing the right prayer and the right singings and listen to the, the priest telling us some, something. It's not a reunion for a personal spiritual experience, and we are lacking of that. That's, I mean, one of the reasons why you have go, uh, to go to the Amazonian. There is our longing for meaningful rituals. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And last uh, two questions. Two questions. Two, yes. two quick questions. Short um, and clear. Quick question. Okay, so you emphasized a few times that we need a lot of time. Yes. Um, now let me ask a bit in a provocative way. We are now at a uh, at a time where you have 50 patients in four years, and then at some point we would like to be there where, say, the 30% of people who experience uh, depression at some point in their life have the possibility to have access to uh, treatment with psychedelic in psychedelics in, in some way. W what is a roadmap from here to, to there? And what are important stepping stones? Yes, for, for me, the roadmap is to, to produce good data that gives us the right to say this is a useful therapy, let's do it. Uh, let's do it with those people, maybe not with them. And I think we need, we need no, not only a feasibility study that says maybe it's a good... A, a good I mean, the, I appreciate the, what they have done, but you know, this is not a real gain of, of knowledge when, when there a small study says it's, it, may, it might be a good substance. We really need more knowledge and I think that should be maybe a ra rather a horizon o of 10 and 15 years that, uh, than 3 to 5 years. And this is, I think, one of the main conflict with the investors. The investors do not want to, want to wait 15 years until they get the money back. They want it <coughs> tomorrow. Okay, so last, last question, yes. Uh, what do you think is the biggest threat to the psychedelic renaissance? The biggest threat? Yeah, a new Timothy Larry or exploitation by capitalism? Oh, <laughs> me personally, my, my biggest anxiety, I always said what happens when big money and big pharma comes into the field. And I think, you don't understand me wrong, I'm not against money or against pharma. I think we need, we need professional structures that help us to bring these, these substances into a prescribable way of dealing with it. And in fact, this is pharma and this is investment. But they should not take over the, the whole thing. They should be also the servants of what we are doing now. They are the helpers, but not the directors of what happens now. And this is my, my biggest anxiety in, the, in that sense, I think. Yes, thank you.